Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me here. So I'll tell you something about the maternal neonatal transmission of SARS-CoV-2. The history uh, started back in February 2020, uh, sounds like uh, one century ago. And uh, as you may see here in the media, the first diagnosis of supposed vertical transmission was actually done. And at that time, I was working a little bit in telemedicine with colleagues from Wuhan, and they sent us the data, and we commented a little bit about that. And this was uh, finally published in Australia's and Gynecology, and it was just a baby uh, with a positive PCR for SARS-CoV-2, but who was doing well. So at that time, it was something that was considered to be possible, but we, we weren't so worry actually about that. But this was only the uh, beginning of the history. As you can see, many data have been accumulated later on, and I'll show you now. Because this is coming from New York City, and these guys were the first one in identifying the variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2 into the placenta, as you may see here, in transmission electrical microscopy, which was a little bit unexpected, although you uh, uh, should start to think that the placenta, at the end of the day, is a lung is the fetal lung somehow. So uh, we should have suspected anyway that the AC2 receptors uh, would be uh, very much expressed over there. And in fact, after this first example from New York City, Others described exactly the same thing. Uh, this has been published in general clinical investigation from Germany. And you see here that the infection, again, in an electron microscopy for SARS-CoV-2, arrived here in the placenta on the fetal side, so uh, very much close to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the fetus and uh, with the possibility to pass through, uh, uh, through uh, the neonate. Then in March, uh, we had unlucky or lucky enough to observe uh, severe uh, neonatal COVID cases. Uh, which we identified uh, for the first time as the real um, uh, transplacental transmission. This has been finally published in Nature Communication. It's a more appropriate print. I'm sorry, this has not been updated. And you may see here on the top of the slide uh, the placenta with a clear inflammatory uh, reaction. And uh, on the bottom of the slide, you see the immunosochemistry for some viral proteins. And you see here on the left corner in brown, all the cells positive to this immunosochemistry, so infected by SARS-CoV-2. While on the right, on the right side, you see some uh, control placenta of um, a COVID pregnancies without any placenta infection, uh, which turned out negative at the immunosochemistry. So actually, the virus richly then actively infected the placental cells and uh, we're not the only one, because again, others, as you may see these pictures again from Germany and from Italy, um, showed exactly the same. And there also is an hypothesis um, telling us that probably the placenta is reacting by an active inflammation, trying to stop the virus and trying to uh, reduce the passage of the virus uh, through the core to the baby, exactly the same way uh, the placenta does for other uh, uh, possibly transmittable uh, infections, uh, like the ones that are under the acronym TORCH. So um, now we have so uh, many data that even a meta-analysis has been published, and you may see here the main results of this meta-analysis from placenta. So I will tell you, as you may see here on the right, that um, uh, there are many signs of inflammation uh, in the placenta from mothers with COVID-19, but the main important thing is that there are um, fetovascular malformation or any way um, a, a, a suboptimal uh, um, uh, vascularization on the fetal side and also on the maternal side in this placenta. And this is done by the inflammation and also a little bit by the uh, direct uh, viral infection. It's probably um, the, the, the the mechanism that makes sometimes possible the passage of the virus through uh, the fetus because um, with this um, vascular disruptions um, it's more possible for the virus to uh, pass the placenta barrier and finally get to the fetus. As I anticipated you, uh, we suspected the ACE2 receptors were expressed uh, in the fetal and in the uh, uh, placental cells. This has been confirmed by many studies on transcriptomics. You may see some here. Um, uh, on that side uh, is the placenta, on the right side are uh, different uh, fetal uh, tissues. But anyway, the message is that ACE2 receptor seems expressed there. And now we know also that the serum proteases, which is uh, important to the cleavage of the, uh, um, of the S protein, the S SARS-CoV-2 protein attaching to the ACE2 receptor may be expressed in the placenta. So the full molecular machinery uh, needed uh, for viral invasion is actually expressed over there. And um, as you may see here from um, this very recent study, uh, applying again immunostochemistry for uh, ACE2 uh, receptors in placentas 
of different gestational age, uh, this is demonstrating that the ACE2 is expressed uh, irrespective of, uh, of gestational age. So this is going from 16 to 40 weeks of gestation, and you clearly see the positivity at the immunohistochemistry irrespective of GA. So uh, is it really happening? Yes, it's happening, although it's rare. And in fact, as you may see here from this graph from Germany, again, from general clinical investigation, the placenta may have a very high viral load. And then a, a significant viral load is also uh, uh, been found in the umbilical cord. And from there, the virus can actually pass. So through an hematogenous way, uh, uh, through the neonate. In fact, uh, in, in Lombardy, in North in Italy, during the first pandemic wave, um, uh, transmission electron microscopy again demonstrated the passage of the virus and its presence in the uh, cord blood, but even in the uh, uh, intracapillary monocyte, fetal monocyte, clearly, that had also been infected by SARS CoV 2 and may represent a sort of a reservoir uh, 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 through, uh, through uh, which the virus can uh, finally spread to the neonate. So, what is actually happening to the neonate? Um, that is what we uh, demonstrated in our um, case study in edge communication, because um, our case uh, actually had severe neonatal COVID with uh, a neurological manifestation consisting of cerebral vasculitis and uh, sort of a COVID meningitis, as you may see here clearly from the MRI. Uh, conversely, on the left side of the screen, you see the uh, uh, PCR curves and you see on the, on the black on, on, on black, the, 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 the placenta curve, again, demonstrating the highest viral load compared to the other, um, to all the other samples that we uh, analyze, which includes the web, which includes also maternal and neonatal blood and uh, the bronchial lavages in, in the baby because it was intubated and the amniotic fluid and so on. So again, this is demonstrated that it was an active replication uh, an active viral load, a very high viral load in the placenta, and then a uh, significant viral load in the newborn blood, and then the clinical manifestation that you, uh, uh, that you saw here. How can we actually uh, give the diagnosis of maternal to fetal uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmission? Well, this is a little bit difficult. There are two uh, proposed classifications over here, uh, over there in the literature. We applied this one coming from SHA, and uh, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter what type of classification you apply, you have to know that you need several samples on the placenta, on the fluid, and in the maternal and newborn blood, and sometimes also to repeat these samples over the first days of life to really understand if there was a maternal fetal passage and where this was happening, through the placenta or intrapartum or later or uh, later uh, in, the, uh, in the first moments of life. So basically the SHA classification is dividing congenital infections, so meaning the transplacental infection with five level of likelihood, as you may see here, and a subdivision according to the presence or, or not of clinical fixtures in the neonates. And then you get also uh, the um, uh, intrapartum acquired neonatal infection, again, with different level of likelihood, and the postpartum acquired infection, which means in the first days of life. So as you can imagine, this is pretty much complicated, but unfortunately, the biology is complicated, and you really need different uh, samples in different time points to really understand. So now WHO is also working on that, on a simplified classification that is not uh, yet um, uh, uh, released, but hopefully we will have that very soon. So based on that classification, we did a synthesis and a meta-analysis of all the uh, um, neonatal SARS-CoV-2 infections that have been published up to uh, September. And these uh, accounts for more or less 180 cases, although you can imagine that there is a quite significant publication bias because uh, we can imagine that people are diving into uh, in the emergencies around the pandemic that they don't have the time to publish in order to do all this um, uh, tests and, and, and sampling to actually understand the things. But when they did, and uh, we meta-analyzed that, uh, we can actually say that 30% of uh, neonatal SARS-CoV-2 infection are at least suspected to be vertical, meaning 
transplacentally or intrapartum acquired, while the 70% of infections are postpartum acquired through the usual, uh, I would say, horizontal and very well-known transmission route, meaning through the droplets and through the contacts with the uh, caregivers and parents that may be infected and while taking care of the baby. And this is clearly described here in the pie chart because the red uh, in different shades is representing the uh, vertical transmission and the blue is representing the horizontal one. So babies with uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, are more or less, seems to be more or less a term, although personally I've seen a couple of, of very uh, extremely prudent babies. And in more than 50% of cases, they are not symptomatic. So here you see a first parallel with adult medicine because it's more or less the same percentage of asymptomatic uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And when they become symptomatic in the other half, you uh, may see a panoply of different clinical manifestation from respiratory, gastrointestinal, neurological, hemodynamics, exactly like in adult patients. What is a little bit interesting here is that we have uh, more than 44% of fever. And for those of you that do not know, uh, this is not so likely. I mean, um, neonates and in general, small infants are not so likely to uh, respond with fever to any type of invasive infection. Although we cannot say that this is actually pathognomonic, it's uh, uh, quite interesting. And then, uh, you have the uh, laboratory and imaging features. No surprise, there are a lot of abnormal lung imaging, lymphopenia, and uh, uh, raised uh, inflammatory biomarkers. So the point here is that um, many of these features, both the lab and imaging and the clinical ones, are shared with other common neonatal disorders, right? So uh, this is, again, another uh, parallel with adult medicine because sometimes it may be pretty difficult to understand if you know, the respiratory distress you are observing is related to COVID or to yellow membrane disease or other um, types of neonatal respiratory failure. So, um, but anyway, I believe that uh, because of that and because the adult experience, neonatologists should raise a um, high level of suspicion and test the babies, which right now, since we, we have all this data, is absolutely mandatory, should be absolutely mandatory. And uh, keep in mind that babies can be infected with, with, with SARS-CoV-2 and at least part of their clinical manifestations can be uh, related to that infection. There has even been um, a case of neonatal ARDS, so uh, the same acute uh, uh, respiratory failure that Many, many years ago, we didn't know was uh, also possible in neonate. Then, uh, as you may probably know, uh, the Montreux definition has been published for defining neonatal ARDS. And uh, uh, this has been done in London. It's the first case of really severe respiratory failure in neonate, uh, as you may see here from the... Uh, uh, from the uh, from the chest films, and also here from the data, this baby has been ventilated for quite a long time, placed under nitric oxide, remdesivir, and uh, and uh, steroids, but no ECMO, and finally with a good outcome. So when I look at the data from the meta-analysis, I will see that 25% uh, of these SARS-CoV-2 infected neonates were admitted to the NICU. But when we look, for example, at the NIH data, for the babies of more or less the same age and birth weight, you see that the rate of NICU admission is less than 10%. What does that mean? Well, only a minority of these babies actually really needed NICU care. And just a few had severe clinical manifestations like the ones that I, uh, that I just mentioned. Despite that, the NICU admission was very high. Why? More likely because uh, people wanted to isolate these babies and there was no other area in the hospital or any way in the maternal department to isolate these babies or any way to take care of them. Well, this is very much worrisome in terms of public health and in terms of you know, maternal care because as I've wrote in Lancet in the beginning of pandemics, and as you may see here, admitting neonates to NICU would be similar to admitting all positive adults to an ICU. Strict admission criteria and prioritization are needed, otherwise we may face a shortage of NICU place, and this is essentially we, we, we do not want. Right now, in the era where um, you know, hospitals are deprogramming and converting wards to take care of COVID patients, the NICU and the nursery is probably the only one that cannot and will never be subjected to that because you cannot the programming deliveries. And as uh, you are um, uh, still having deliveries, you will always have some neonatal emergencies and you will always need uh, NICU beds.
So the meta-analysis also showed, as you may see here, that the breastfeeding does not seem to be a significant risk factor for uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, after the first 72 hours of life. The diamond on the left is on the left here. Conversely, the lack of maternal neonatal separation in the very first days of life when the mother is symptomatic, that is a significant risk factor for late neonatal SARS-CoV-2 infection, meaning after the first three days of life. Why so? Well, because when the mother is symptomatic, we know that this is the uh, point with the highest contagiousness. And it seems logical that unfortunately, uh, this increases the risk for um, a neonatal infection. Well, with, with the data we have right now, we cannot give any clue about the use of mask and PPE and adequate hygiene measure by this mother. Clearly, we do not have uh, this level of details in this data. It's absolutely possible that if PPE and hygiene measures were being uh, implemented very well, uh, uh, this lack of separation would not be a, a significant factor for uh, uh, risk factors for uh, uh, late neonatal uh, infection. But I believe that the main message here is that we should be a little bit cautious and apply a little bit of common sense like our grandmother that were <laughs> used to tell us not to uh, you know, kiss the baby when you got flu. So uh, the same should be here. And personally, what we do here is that we uh, discuss openly with parents. And if the mother is still highly symptomatic, we suggest to do a separation for some days. And otherwise, if this is not possible for uh, logistic problems or if they don't want, well, we enforce and we explain uh, uh, very much in detail how to use PPA, hydroalcoholic gels and mask and so on, and to take care of that. Um, a positive message about that is that there is a meta-analysis of all the COVID pregnancies. So now I'm talking about the mothers, not about the neonates. And uh, when you take all the mothers into consideration and you see uh, the, the your analysis, the possible rate of vertical transmission, you see here the, the, the number of the bottom is 3.2. So slightly more than 3% of COVID pregnancies seems to... Uh, end up uh, uh, with, a, with a neonate positive for, for SARS-CoV-2, which is a very low, which is a very low uh, percentage telling us that, yes, uh, SARS-CoV-2 can actually infect newborn babies. In the beginning, we didn't know that, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, an uncommon, it's an uncommon experience. Although within this 3%, there may be severe cases, as I showed you, uh, as I showed you before. So um, uh, trying to understand what is actually happening and to have more data on that, this is also why the European Society for Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care, together with the collaboration of the Marduk Children Research Center um, in Melbourne, in Australia, launched this uh, international um, registry called Epicenter uh, that actually aims to collect data from all the COVID uh, pregnancies and also for uh, uh, about children uh, getting COVID or anyway getting SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, later in life. And um, uh, the registry is now working since quite uh, a few months. We have more than 100 centers all around the world collecting data. And uh, uh, let's say the initiative and the, the protocol detail have been published in the European Journal of Pediatrics, as you may see here. And the paper is absolutely um, free to be downloaded. And if you want to know more or join us or any way, uh, write me to uh, any type of collaboration. I will be uh, more than happy to answer all your questions. And uh, uh, those are our mails. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll be there to take all your questions. Thank you very much.